from the NBC News Election Center in New York, Decision 78. Reported by John Chancellor, David Brinkley, Tom Brokaw, and Jessica Savage. Here is John Chancellor. Good evening and welcome to NBC's coverage of the 1978 elections in which the future of the U.S. Senate, the House of Representatives, and 36 governors will be decided by the voters who were voting today, along with thousands of other offices. NBC's gifted team of political analysts has some projected winners even at this hour, and our first is Governor James Thompson of Illinois. NBC News projects Governor Thompson to be re-elected in his contest against the Democrat Michael Bacallus in Illinois, and that will help Jim Thompson's presidential feelings, if he has any, for next year. We are also projecting in the state of Alabama, Forrest James as the winner there. Um, an easy run for James to replace Governor George Wallace, who is retiring. Fob James, our projected winner in for the governor of... Alabama. And NBC News has projected a winner in the state of Kentucky. Senator Walter Huddleston of Elizabethtown is our projected winner. We think he'll be going back for a second term. We also have another Alabama projection. We project Howell Heflin as the winner there, the former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, to go to the Senate to fill the seat held for so many years by John Sparkman. And in Louisiana, uh, J. Bennett Johnston won the primary last September, and he will be going back to the United States Senate. If you win the primary in September in Louisiana, you don't have to worry about the fall election. And let's have a look around. We have our famous map here, and as you can see, the, uh, we don't have any Republican projections yet, but in Louisiana, in part of Alabama, and in Kentucky, the map is colored red. When we project winners this evening, and they are Republicans, the states in which they are projected winners will turn up blue on your screen. You'll also see some states where we won't have winners at all. For example, in North Dakota, it's very calm this year. One congressman is running. Nobody's running for anything else. We also will be able, although not on this map that you've just seen, to show you what's happening in Alaska, where they've got a contest for Senate and for the governor this evening. And also, we'll be able to show you what's taking place in Hawaii. When they've stopped counting the votes there, there's a governor's race and the usual house race. That's where we stand as of the beginning of what we think will be a very interesting evening. David? This is the beginning of it, John. The chicken has been eaten, the speech is made, and the money spent. The results are beginning to arrive, and the winners and losers will soon be known. We'll be here to bring them to you. You and we, all of us, have been through election nights before, but we have never before been through one where so many people were voting to cut their taxes, or voting against paying taxes or paying so much. And we may be seeing the beginning of a time when the American people's habit of handing over their money, docile and sheep-like, are over. And, of course, as John has said, we are electing, the country is electing governors, senators, and speaking of governors, Tom Brokaw is in charge of that. Tom? David, we're going to be counting 36 races for governors tonight, and you were just talking about what's going on in terms of the public attitude toward tax cutting and government costs. Well, the governors, whoever is elected tonight, are in for a tough time clear across the country for the next two or four years, whatever the length of their term. We'll be watching them because some of them will be measured on their performance as governor as for their future presidential prospects, specifically in California, where Jerry Brown has made no secret of the fact that he may be interested in running for the presidency again. We have already projected James Thompson, the Republican from Illinois, who said as early as his high school years that he would like to be president of the United States someday. It's a thought that he has not rejected since he's come to public office. We'll also be taking a look at some of the new faces around the country. One of them is Fob James, our projected winner in Alabama. He describes himself as a born-again Democrat. He left the Democratic Party at the time of George McGovern, raised a lot of money for Republicans in Alabama, then jumped back into the Democratic Party when George Wallace was no longer eligible to run for office. He's a former Auburn University football star. He made a fortune inventing the plastic dumbbell. And now he is politically ambitious, one of the new governors in the South that we'll be watching, along with a lot of other new faces around plastic the country. Plastic dumbbell? The plastic dumbbell. That's right. The plastic I molds sure filled. I heard you right. That's right. <laughs> well, that and a lot of other athletic equipment, we're told. He even makes ping pong uh, tables and a lot of other things. He made a lot of money, and he's made a lot of friends in Alabama because he uh, not only manufactures athletic equipment, but he was a football star in that state where they put a high premium on that. We'll also be taking a look at how these uh, governors are running tonight on the issue of taxes and government spending, and I can tell you all of them are singing the 
theme, Proposition 13. There isn't a governor running for office or a challenger uh, going after that office across this country who is not saying that if they're elected, they will lower taxes or lower government spending or both. The governors are within reach of all of these angry taxpayers, and they know that they have to measure up. John? I think it's very interesting that Jim Thompson came in. Obviously, we don't have enough of the vote yet to go into it in any detail, but that he came in so early in the evening uh, with obviously a commanding lead in our um, analysis that uh, I think he had 65% of the vote the last time when he ran, didn't he, Tom? Yeah, they could not get a, hand, we had a million and a half uh, vote margin the last time that he ran against a guy that everyone agrees in Illinois was pretty much of a turkey of a candidate, Michael Hollett, who was a it was a product of the Daily Machine and kind of a desperation candidate at that. And Thompson just ran all over him, all over the state. This time he got a little stiffer challenge, but still managed to run well. He has a referendum on the ballot out there. He wants an advisory on what he ought to do about taxes and government spending. His opponent called it Proposition Zero, but it didn't seem to have any effect. Interestingly, two years ago, Jim Thompson was married during the campaign. This year, his wife managed to have a baby, as one of his Democratic opponents pointed out. So it's worked, out, it's worked out pretty well for him. I think it's time to go to Jessica. Jessica, what have you got for us? We've got a couple of Senate races. We've got 33 Senate races, but John, as you mentioned before, two of them were already decided. One of them in the state of Alabama, where the Democrat Howell Heflin, a strong candidate, he was such a st such strong candidate in Alabama that no one wanted to run against him. And also in Louisiana, Jay Bennett Johnston won the primary there. He got 55.2% of the vote in Louisiana, as John mentioned, if you get that strong a majority you automatically win the race. We've got other Senate races. You projected, as a matter of fact, Walter D. Huddleston, the winner in the state of Kentucky. No surprise there. He ran against Louis Gunther, a practicing attorney from the State House, conservative from Northfield. And about the only thing he could come up with to talk against Huddleston on was the fact that Huddleston voted to confirm HEW Secretary Joseph Califano. And in Kentucky, where they have a lot of tobacco, Califano wasn't exactly the most popular man. Evidently, that was ineffective. Huddleston was expected to win. He did win very early on in the evening. The senators that are running in the other races, of course, taxes are an heart issues. The Republicans are saying they talk taxes all along. Senator Howard Baker mentioned that any Republican that didn't talk taxes in this race missed the boat completely. The Democrats are talking President Carter's tax cut proposals. Everybody's talking taxes. Everybody's trying to make the most of it. A couple of interesting races were watching tough ones in Illinois, Chuck Percy. In Massachusetts, of course, Edward Brooke. In Texas, John Towers running a difficult race. And for the Democrats, they're closely watching the race in West Virginia with Jennings Randolph. And in Maine, Senator William Hathaway trying to hang on to the Senate seat that he won from Margaret Chase Smith six years ago. And so there are some interesting Senate races, and we'll be watching them all this evening. What do you, think will, what do you think will come of all this tax talk? You will recall, of course, that Congress voted to cut taxes this year, and it's going to wind up most people will pay more. Exactly. How many tax cuts like that will the American public be able to afford, would you say? I would say the American public is probably going to wind up deciding on the basis of who's going to give us the most, or at least promise to give us the most in the long run. I have a projection, Jessica, which may or may not bring you up out of your chair. It is that in Illinois, the uh, so-called Proposition Zero, it was a question put to the people, and the question was, would you like to have some kind of law reducing your taxes and reducing state spending? Our projection is that the result in that vote is yes. I, uh, I no, say, no I'm, surprise there. I'm there. not, I'm not that sure that'll bring anyone up out of his chair. We'll be back in a minute. Some names mean quality around the world. One is the name of a jeweler from Fort Madison, Iowa, who decided 70 years ago that this was no way to fill a fountain pen. Walter Schaefer soon found the answer, but he spent five years perfecting it before he started production. Basic technology has progressed through the years, and styles have changed in response to changing fashion, but Schaefer craftsmanship survives. Schaefer nibs are still ground by hand. Schaefer ballpoints are meticulously tested, and Schaefer quality is appreciated in over 140 countries. Now Textron has united Schaefer pen and Eaton paper to provide the perfect combination at home or in the office. And the Schaefer Eaton division of Textron is nearly 3,000 people whose standards Walter Schaefer could be proud of. Building a reputation and living up to it, that's what private enterprise is all about. And that's what we do at every division of Textron. The Stevens Estate. The $20,000 Mercedes looks right at home. So does the $5,000 Granada Ghia, sometimes mistaken for a Mercedes. 
It's an American classic. Meredith Manor, Mercedes styling looks at home. And Granada's does too. Hamilton House, Mercedes classic styling. Granada's classic styling. And the Granada price makes it right at home at any home. The 79 Ford Granada at your Ford dealer. I would like to explain to those of you in the audience the gadget that we're using here this evening. It's the way we get the returns here at the anchor desk, and that is this computer terminal that you see here. There's a keyboard. You can't quite see it there, but we can call up various races around the country, and I'm going to see if I can make it work now in terms of the house races in Indiana, and lo and behold, there it is. That's how we get our votes. These change all night long. They're driven by a computer. And this is where we and the rest of the NBC News team gets its information. And, for example, here's a story that you can't read it, but let me tell it anyway, that John Bradamus, the majority whip of the House, appears to be on his way to a strong victory. He's got 62% of the vote in now. To, uh, Thorson, his opponent, has 38% of the vote. And we've got 42% of the precincts reporting. That is a strong victory, not totally unexpected for John Bradamus, although sometimes that's a difficult district for him to run in. That's not a projection that he will win, only a statement of where he is now. Also in Kentucky, veteran Democratic Congressman Carl Perkins seems to be on his way back to Washington for a 16th term. That's a long time. Perkins has a three to one lead with about half of the precincts in. We don't really know what's going to happen to the House of Representatives tonight. We will try to tell you as our analysts go over the figures from all these races. There are 70 unopposed House members, but we'll be looking at all the rest. We do not expect anything like the Democratic disaster in 1946 when the Democrats lost 55 seats in the House, or the Republican disaster of 1974 when the Republicans lost 48. It'll be much narrower than that in our view, and we'll keep you up with that story as the evening progresses. David? John, I detect a growing, not to say touching, affection between you and that machine. I there. love those machines. Oh, you've been I, they're just sensational. You've been playing with it all week. I want to take it home, and they won't let me. Well, why not? During the day and tonight, we're still at it, NBC News and the Associated Press have been asking people questions, polling them as they left voting places. 1,200 voting places throughout the United States, the biggest poll ever taken here or anywhere. So far, we have answers from 22,000 people. When we finish, it'll be 30-odd thousand. Answers to questions about the issues in the election and why they voted as they did. And one of the issues, particularly this year and this election, is taxes. Whether or not they should be cut, and if so, how much. We will look at this all night. We'll bring you the results as soon as we get them. Some one question we have asked, should people refuse to pay taxes until the taxes and spending are cut? 42% said yes. 42% of the American people said they were willing to violate the law until taxes are cut to their satisfaction. 48% said no. Those opposed to withholding taxes, 48%. Those in favor, 42%. So there is a tremendous number of people who were, who were talking about tax rebellion in terms of simply refusing to pay the money, refusing to hand it over. John? We have a couple of very interesting calls. NBC News now projects in the state of Illinois, Senator Charles Percy as a projected winner in the contest for Senate there. We say by our figures that Senator Percy, who had one of the toughest and roughest contests in the country this year, will be going back for a third term, defeating his, Republican, his Democratic opponent, Alex Seath. We also have a projected winner in the state of Georgia. Senator Sam Nunn is our projected winner there. We believe he'll be going back for a second term. That's a call. That was not unexpected. Senator Nunn was supposed to have won. His opponent spent $2,139 in the early parts of the campaign, and I don't think he really felt he was going to win. Um, we also have at NBC tonight correspondents, reporters, and camera crews stationed out around the country looking at the situation in various towns of different kinds and talking with different kinds of voters. We're going to talk to one of those reporters now out in the country talking with farmers and people from a small town in Oskaloosa, Iowa, Bob Dotson. John, when this band shell was built, the big, uh, the big political story there, it was whether or not there was going to be honesty in government and also what to do about all those pressure groups that were pressuring Congress. Sound familiar? Well, the year was 1886, and that was also the first year that people started to meet here at the Oskaloosa County Courthouse to listen to and watch election returns. 
Well, that tradition still continues, and inside tonight, Don Allgood is readying the big board. He is also has a personal stake in this because Don is uh, also running for one of the offices. And uh, some people say that when the elections get tight, his uh, handwriting gets a little bit hard to read. At any rate, people here do have a long time to uh, listen to the problems and to think them over. And Don Good, do you think that there are any ways to solve any of these problems? Yes, I'm sure there are. Uh, we have a saying around here that Oskaloosa is the navel of the universe, that all creation began here and evolved outward and filled up the rest of space. So I well, think we do it. at any rate, there are about 15% uh, of the people are supposed to be voting now and uh, maybe all the way to uh, about 50% by the end of the evening at 9 o'clock Central Time. Bob Dodson from Oskaloosa. Bob Dodson in the navel of the universe. We have a projection in Georgia in the race for governor. We project that the winner is Busby, the Democrat, the incumbent. Our projection is that Busby has won re-election in Georgia. All our projections so far have been Democrats winning Democratic offices and Republicans winning Republican offices. No one as yet, neither party as yet, has been able to take anything away from the other. We'll be back in a minute. Fruit cocktail is too big an idea to cut into little pieces. That's why there's Libby's Chunky Mixed Fruits. Fresh, juicy pieces of fruit cut big and firm and chunky. So you can taste each piece of fruit one big piece at a time. Libby's Chunky Mixed Fruits. And now, chunky pears and chunky peaches. Cut bigger to taste better. From three of the best names in the business. Brown Concord's getting a ticket. Concord? My Brown Concord. Why is American Motors Concord such a success? Value. Because the AMC Concord DL comes with luxury extras like a Landau roof, crushed velour seats, and digital clock at no extra charge. Plus a smooth, quiet ride with the best EPA-estimated gas mileage of any compact. He's kidding. It's not a brown Concord. It's red. Red. Red! 1979 AMC Concord, the new American success story. Now that you've had a drink, oh, what a time to think. Wow, I could have had a V8. Snacking the whole day through, oh, what that does to you. Wow, I could have had a V8. V8 cocktail vegetable juice is a great tasting, healthful blend that's naturally low in calories, only 35 a 6 ounce serving. But remember, the time to think of having a V8 is before you've had something else. Wow, I could have had a V8. Last election night, as you may recall, we had Tom Pettit of our staff in Milwaukee in a place called Serb Hall getting opinions from people who were in there. There was, I must say, a certain amount of drinking going on and they seem to be having a good time, quite noisy. This year, we have managed to get him out of there and get him into another place. Now, what is it called, the Golden Dawn? Golden Bar? Dawn Bar. In uh, Youngstown, Ohio, where we will hear from Tom at intervals during the evening. Tom? David, this is the Golden Dawn Restaurant and Bar in Youngstown, Ohio. This is a very basic town. And this is a very basic bar and grill. It's been in the Naples family since 1934. It's now run by Ralph and Carmen Naples and their sons gathered behind the bar working on this election night. A real cross-section of Youngstown people come to this place. Ethnic groups save blacks. Professors and students at Youngstown State University. People in business and tonight people who, well, just wandered in off the street. This is Tom Pettit, NBC News, at the Golden Dawn Restaurant and Bar in Youngstown, Ohio. He I loves the saying that. He just loves saying that. Okay. <laughs> we have, as part of our survey of how people are talking about the election, what they're saying, Kenley Jones is in Orlando, Florida, with some older people who have real issues in this campaign. Kenley? John, I was about to call this room a parlor, but I got corrected. This is the lounge of the Magnolia Towers, a high-rise apartment building in Orlando, which is occupied exclusively by members of what is becoming one of the nation's fastest-growing political blocks, the elderly. All of the people here are 62 years of age or older. None of them has an income of more than $9,000 a year. 
Some of them like to describe themselves as members of the middle class of senior citizens, not poor enough to be on welfare, but not rich enough to make it on their own without some sort of help for government assistance in health care or to help pay the rent. Longevity is increasing in this country and the birth rate is going down, so that means the percentage of the population of elderly people is going up each year. And so is the amount of federal tax dollars that goes toward services and benefits for the elderly. In fact, it adds up to about one-fourth of the federal budget. Now, there are a lot of questions about what this so-called gray power means in terms of potential political clout at the polls, and we'll be trying to find some of the answers to that tonight as we watch the returns with the residents here, as well as get the perspective of age and experience about what the results may mean. This is Kenley Jones at the Magnolia Towers in Orlando, Florida. Kenley, thank you. We'll come back from time to time and hear what's happening there. So far this evening, in the first 20-odd minutes since we have started bringing you the election returns, we have some projections, which you heard if you were with us. We have projected as winners George Busby as the governor of Georgia, James Thompson as the governor of Illinois, Sam Nunn re-elected to the Senate in Georgia, Charles Percy re-elected to the Senate in Illinois. That was supposed to be a very close race. It turned out to be a little less than that, but in any case, Percy we have projected as the winner in Illinois. And we have projected Walter Huddleston re-elected to the Senate in Kentucky. We'll have others as the uh, evening goes along. In fact, we'll have a great deal more. What is it, 70-some altogether? We oh, have we have about 75, I think. 75? We'll, we'll get all the way through So uh, stay with us, and uh, we'll have lots of names, lots of winners, and s uh, the same number of losers. I think uh, Illinois is interesting. Illinois narrowly went for President Ford in the last election, and it's going Republican again. The Democrats have been unable to shake those two big offices there. I think that has a message for 1980. And we'll be back after this. Decision 78 continues with the Tri-State Report. Brought to you by American Airlines. Now here are Chuck Scarborough and Jack Cafferty. Well, good evening to you and welcome to New Center 4's coverage of election returns in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. We'll be here throughout the evening to keep you up to date with all the results in the metropolitan area. We will do our best to bring you the excitement of tonight's winners as well as the disappointment of today's losers throughout the evening. And the polls are open for another 35 minutes in Connecticut and New Jersey, for another hour and 35 minutes in New York, so we don't have any results yet, but you'll get them as soon as we get them. And of course, hundreds of people have been working all year long to get us tonight's results, and now is the time all of us, just like all of the candidates, have been working toward. Of course, the big race in New York focuses on the new four-year lease of the governor's mansion in Albany. Until the September primary, it looked as though the state's voters were about to hand Governor Hugh Carey an eviction notice. Making matters even more difficult for Kerry, his Republican opponent, Assembly Minority Leader Perry Durier, won nomination without a bitter primary fight. Kerry, though, became the first incumbent ever to face a primary challenge. In addition to Brooklyn State Senator Jeremiah Bloom, Kerry was opposed by his own Lieutenant Governor, Marianne Krupsack. She broke with Kerry just two days before the two were to announce for re-election. Kerry won that primary easily, though. He got more than half the vote, beating Krupsack by three to two and simply overwhelming Bloom. This is the primary. Kerry and Duryea have debated time and again in the past six weeks. Sometimes it's been a little bit difficult to find a television station they weren't on, bitterly arguing over taxes, unemployment, aid to New York City, even each other's finances. Each ended by spending up about $5 million in this campaign. Now, we have reporters at the headquarters of both candidates, and we'll check first with Melba Tolliver at the governor's command post. Melba? Chuck, you know, the governor has had a reputation as a come-from-behind winner, probably a good thing, too, because for a few months it looked like his political career was just about washed up. His own lieutenant governor challenged him in the primary and at the time described him as cold, aloof, difficult to get along with. And in the early polls, he was not all that popular with voters, and they showed him badly trailing his Republican opponent. But apparently the polls and the tables have turned. Carrie is expected to be an easy winner here tonight. Now to Pia Lindstrom at Duryea headquarters. 
Thank you, Melba. This is a night that Perry Durier has waited for for a long time. He first ran for governor in 1974, but he was indicted on an election law violation charge that was later dismissed. He began to raise money for this campaign last year. And at that time, he was at, at occasionally 20 points uh, ahead on the polls. But as the campaign went on, he appeared to slip behind, and it certainly looks as though Mr. Durier is fighting an uphill battle tonight. Back to the studio and you, Jack. All right, thank you, Pia. We'll have more of the Tri-State Report right after this. On American Airlines, you get what you pay for. As a full fare passenger, only you can select a seat when you make your reservation. You can select seats for your whole trip, including connections and your flight back home. And you can get all your boarding passes at once to avoid all those lines. On American, you finally get the full fare treatment you deserve. You get what you pay for. We're American Recently, some college students picketed their cafeteria when it replaced Dan and Yogurt with another brand. One loyal Dan and user actually nicknamed her baby boy after our yogurt. This young fan just added the 15,000th Dan and Lid to his wall. And at Calhoun High School, there's even a Bagrat Tapagua fan club. We make our yogurt as natural and wholesome as can be. So maybe the reason people are loyal to Dan and is because we're so loyal to them. The big news in New Jersey, of course, is the Senate race between two men who have never before held elective office. The Democratic candidate is well known because of his basketball, not his politics. He is former New York Knicks star Bill Bradley. Republican opponent Jeffrey Bell, also in his 30s, is not so well known, but that didn't seem to hurt him in last June's primary when he managed to squeak by veteran Clifford Case, getting 51% of the vote. And Bradley's win in a six-way race was just as impressive as any of his athletic feats with the Knicks or with Princeton University. He ended up getting almost three of every five votes cast. Now, in Connecticut, voters are deciding whether to give Ella Grasso another four years in the governor's mansion there. She has looked very, very strong during the campaign that has followed her victory in a bitter primary fight with her own lieutenant governor. And as you can see, we have the primary results. She won that race with ease. Also in New Jersey and Connecticut, we will have results of 15 congressional races. We'll check the Essex County executive battle and other questions like, will New Jersey okay highlight gambling? And we'll be getting live reports from both states where the polls will be closing now in just over 30 minutes. Check. And in addition to seeing the raw vote totals, we're gonna try to give you an idea of why voters made their choices the way they did. Uh, keeping tabs on the new Center for Associated Press poll is Tony Guida. Tony? Chuck, before sunrise, a small army of almost 300 people began questioning voters at 275 polling places throughout the tri-state area. The scientific, uh, scientifically selected districts enable us to know a great deal about who voted for whom and why. So I'll be here throughout the night to try to give a little meaning to all the numbers that we'll be seeing and hearing. Jack? All right, Tony, thank you. And Carl Stokes is going to help us analyze the returns tonight. Carl, of course, is a former 2-2 mayor of Cleveland, Ohio, and he is well-equipped to tell us about the sweaty palms that election nights can cause. Is there anything in particular we ought to be looking for this evening? They said earlier that the turnout in New York City was heavier than had been expected. The rain held off till late in the day. Is that, a, is that an indication of anger on the part of the electorate? Frustration? They're going to go out and change things? Are they interested this time around? How do you read the <coughs> heavy turnout? I think it indicates two things, Jack. First, that the uh, campaign has been made more exciting and more informative to people than we, the experts, had said it was going to be. Secondly, that this year, the fact that the candidates rely so much on mass media indicates clearly that there's going to be a change in that kind of campaigning in the future. That just means probably, what, more money now uh, on the campaigns as they go along each year, right? More money Ten million dollars for governor. This more year. money and fewer people involved. Okay, Carl, thank you very much. We'll be back with more tri-state returns for you in 20 minutes. Stay tuned now for more from John Chancellor and David Brinkley as Decision 78 continues. New York, where every other citizen is a greaser at heart. Grease for peace. Give it a
What is the James Bond side of the television business? The answer makes lively reading in the new issue of TV Guide magazine. Take a break with Bob and Mary, weekdays 4 to 5, here on 4. From the NBC News Election Center in New York, Decision 78, reported by John Chancellor, David Brinkley, Tom Brokaw, and Jessica Savage. Here is John Chancellor. And at this hour, we've got some fairly interesting projections. Uh, and let's go to our map and see how we're doing there. In terms of the Senate projections that we have made so far, polls still open in many states, but we have enough information so that we can color Illinois blue on our map in terms of the Senate race. That means that Senator Charles Percy is our projected winner in the state of Illinois, a Republican senator who has already served two terms, but darn near got knocked off by a very strong Democratic challenger there. Uh, we have also, uh, we now have calculated that we have four Democratic senators as our projected winner and one Republican senator as our projected winner so far. And let's see what the map tells us about governors. In terms of governors around the country, we have projected two southern states and one middle western state. Uh, George Busby in Georgia, uh, Fob James in Alabama are our projected winners for governor, and again in Illinois, Jim Thompson, we believe, going back for a second turn. And that gives us these figures so far this evening in terms of governors. We project two elected Democrats, one Republican elected. David? An election night tradition is the victory or defeat, as it may be, party in various places in all of the states where there are elections. There are always a lot of crackers and a lot of cheese and a lot of paper cups. In California, no one knows very much yet because the polls are still open, but Bill Sternoff is there checking it out. Bill, tell us what's happening. We are in Beverly Hills where the temperature today was in the 80s. There are tree-lined streets here. There are luxurious homes. And tonight we've come to one of these homes, David, Inside a tent here, there will be a party and we'll meet a cross-section of the people who live in the community, doctors, lawyers, business executives, perhaps a star or two. There will be about 90 guests in all. We'll be talking with them about this election. They live in a community where many of their neighbors are involved in the elections. Just down the block, a few miles away in Santa Monica, the son of actor Gregory Peck, Kerry Peck, is running for election to Congress. He's opposing Robert Dornan, the Republican incumbent, and both candidates have found it useful, if not necessary, to have good friends in Beverly Hills. This is California, the state that brought us Ronald Reagan, the state that brought us Proposition 13, and we'll be talking to people about the issues. Very elegant. We'll uh, come back and see how it goes. Our NBC News AP poll takers so far have questioned 22,000 voters, which is quite a poll, and they aren't finished yet. One thing they asked was whether the voters would like to see a cut in federal taxes, even if it meant some federal government services would be cut, including some they liked. More than half said yes. 55% said yes, they would like to see that. 20% said no, not if it meant big cuts in important services. 25% said they weren't sure, perhaps because they would like to know more about what services would be cut. We asked the same voters, the same voters, whether they would like to see a thir one-third cut in state and local taxes. 53% said yes, they certainly would. 25% said no, they didn't want to see that. And of those who were not sure, 22%. When we asked, um, Two-thirds of the Republicans we questioned, by the way, were in favor of tax cuts. Tom? John, for a lot of candidates, or David, for a lot of candidates around the country tonight, there's going to be a certain amount of tension. But in Illinois, Governor Jim Thompson can sit back and relax. We have projected already that he has been elected to four years more in the Illinois governor's office. Jim Thompson running very strongly in Illinois, the Republican candidate there, among three groups who traditionally give strong support to Democrats in that state. Our NBC News Associated Press poll shows that Thompson got 58% of the vote among young people, for example. Among Jewish voters in Illinois, Thompson picked up 57% of the vote. And among black voters, traditionally strong for Democrats, in Illinois statewide, James Thompson, the Republican, picked up 37%, almost 40% of the black vote going for Jim Thompson. 
Uh, he was running against a strong Democratic nominee, Michael Bacallus. And Thompson is a potential presidential candidate in 1980 or in the years beyond that. He's only 42 years old. So his strength among traditional Democratic voters tonight is particularly significant, and it must give him some comfort. In the past two years that he has been governor, his lifestyle in Illinois has received some criticism. In an attempt to soften that somewhat, he gave up the traditional limousine, and he hired a checker limousine. And so for the next four years or so, Jim Thompson can continue to ride around Illinois as governor in his checker limousine. John? I wonder what they're thinking about all this at the White House, and why don't we ask John Dancy, who's there, to tell us. John? John, here at the, uh, at the White House, uh, Jimmy Carter, of course, came in as a relative newcomer, but he very quickly learned how the game is played in this city, and that is that you don't get something for nothing. And you don't get people to campaign for you on the tough votes and to vote for you on the tough votes unless you do something for them. So for the past month, the president has been out campaigning. He spent six days on the road, campaigned in 14 states for Democratic candidates. The president has said that this election will be a fairly accurate measurement of how his administration has done for the past two years. But it'll also be a fairly accurate measurement of how it will do during the next two years because the people being elected to the Senate and the House are the people who will be voting on some tough issues like SALT and the wage insurance plan. The president has been up at Camp David today. He's due back here at the White House momentarily to watch the election results tonight. You'll be hoping, of course, that some of those people for whom he campaigned will be appropriately grateful the next time a tough vote comes up in the Senate. Well, we'll see. John Dancy, NBC News, at the White House. The president was out and around the country, as John said, in a number of states. We have tallied those states, and this evening, as we get the returns, we'll be able to tell you whether Mr. Carter had any effect or not, to the best of our knowledge. We'll be back with more coverage of the 1978 election after this. A surprising message to Rolaids users. Tums neutralizes one-third more acid than Rolaids. Watch this familiar demonstration. One Rolaids and one Tums tablet are added to stomach acid. Both neutralize the acid. But on those occasions, when your stomach has even this much more excess acid, Tums can still absorb it. Rolaids can't. Because tablet for tablet, Tums neutralizes one-third more acid than Rolaids. For acid indigestion and heartburn, take Tums. If you're at all like me, you take a lot of pride in the car you drive. A car like this 79 four-door Chrysler Newport. And I don't mean just being proud of the way it looks, feels, or rides. Because now you can be proud of things like gas mileage for a change. And getting all this Chrysler at such a very down-to-earth price. You see, with this 1979 Chrysler Newport, now you can have it all. Now. Right now. is opening up. Mine isn't. Well, sometimes plastic wraps cling and sometimes they don't. But you can always rely on Reynolds Wrap Aluminum Foil. It molds and closes tightly. Helps keep food fresh and protective. And I use it to cook your turkey and stuffing. <laughs> need help, Mom? Got all I need right here. <laughs> Reynolds Wrap, the best wrap around. And we have more on the U.S. Senate. Senator Howard Baker reportedly is ahead in uh, his uh, race against Jane Eskins there in Tennessee. He's the Republican leader in the Senate. And kind of the big story of the evening is what happened to Chuck Percy in Illinois. He had been 17 points behind in the very respected Sun-Times straw poll, and some sympathy came up for him in a tough campaign. He was gaining about a point a day, as I recall. In any case, Percy is our projected winner in Illinois, and Jim Cummins is at his headquarters now. John, John here at Senator Percy's headquarters in Chicago, his supporters have ordered cheese and crackers, a stiff wine punch, and they've asked a six-piece band to play Hallelujah tonight because they did expect him to win re-election. And now the NP NBC News poll has confirmed that. Senator Percy was trailing by as much as 17 points, as you mentioned, in one straw poll only a week ago. Then he went on television and told the voters, I got your message. Now send me back to Washington so I can take it with me. The loudest message came from angry Republican conservatives angered by Senator Percy's liberal voting record on issues like ERA and the Panama Canal Treaty. A top Percy aide told me just a short time ago that he thinks they've mollified the conservatives. 
and they expect him to win by at least 10 percentage points. So they're getting ready for a victory celebration here at Percy headquarters. Jim Cummins, NBC News in Chicago. Jessica, have you got any more based on the, what the returns we do have from Illinois? We have a breakdown, John, on some of the votes. On the Percy race. On the Percy race. Republican Senator Charles Percy's victory in Illinois stemmed partly from his strong support by blacks, the under 35 group, and the Jewish vote. The big surprise, how well he did among black voters. The blacks normally Democratic, 50% there voted Republican for Percy. The under 35 vote, the youth vote, 54% went for Percy, and he got 58% of the Jewish vote. That's a vote that is traditionally Democratic. It's surprising because his opponent, Seif, made much of the fact that Percy was one of the people to support Earl Butts in his nomination for Agriculture Secretary. And then after Earl Butts' racial slur, his opponent said, well, Percy had supported Butts. However, Percy was one of the first ones to downgrade Butts for his comments. And the black vote there going to Percy was a surprise since his opponent Seath had made much of that. Also, the strong showing that he did among Jewish voters was somewhat of a surprise because Percy had a very liberal voting record on the Senate. He voted with the president insofar as the arms sales to Saudi Arabia. And Seath again made much of that, saying that much of the Jewish vote in Illinois would be opposed to that. So Chuck Percy, when he went home, when he was leaving the Senate, said, I am worried. I'm afraid my supporters won't come out. I'm that far ahead that I might not be able to get the support that I badly need. He went home. The polls showed him running behind. Obviously, he was able to muster support. Last week, he ran a commercial that said, you want to send me a message? Well, if you don't hurry up, I won't be here Tuesday. So get out and vote for me. And obviously, that must have worked for him. John? Actually, it's David. I Jessica David? in Massachusetts the only state to vote for McGovern. There are two extremely close and extremely interesting races, both for Senate and for governor. The polls are still open in Massachusetts and will be for another 18 minutes. So we don't have any returns yet, but we're going to the Brook headquarters in Boston and to Lee McCarthy to see how it looks there. Lee? David, although this is a Democratic state, the Republican Senate here, Edward Brook, has been elected twice and was considered a shoe-in for a third term. But this year, a liberal congressman, Paul Songus, the Democrat, waged a strong campaign, and the race is said to be close. Songus and Brooke disagree on some foreign policy issues and defense issues, but agree on most domestic issues. So Songus cast himself as an alternative rather than a clear-cut ideological choice, and he enlisted the formidable support of Senator Edward Kennedy in his campaign. The Brook campaign was troubled by his personal problems, allegations of irregularities in his personal finances. And just two weeks ago, polls showed Songus ahead of Brook. But now in the Brook camp, the people feel that a strong showing before the Senate Ethics Committee and a last-minute TV campaign may have been enough to close the gap. And shortly, they will know whether it was enough to save the seat of the only black in the U.S. Senate. This is Lee McCarthy at Brook headquarters. Um, we have various other races to report to you as of now with not a lot of the vote in i must say but it's uh they, it's very close in south carolina where pug ravenel is running against strom thurmond the the figures that we have on tom you'll be interested in this you probably know it but uh we've got howard baker a little bit ahead of uh, mrs eskins in tennessee you uh, have more on the Senate. You were talking about governors. <laughs> I am talking about. We've got it all. Talks about governors. I'm gonna. I'd be glad to talk about the Senate. I've got some things to say about that too. But I'm I think sure I get you this do. Information too. out of the, about the governors out of the way a little bit. Uh, John, we've projected a couple of winners in the South already, and we've got uh, some numbers from Florida, where, as you know, there's a very interesting governor's race going on right now. Uh, three races for governor in Florida. A couple of new faces. A couple of new names. Uh, first of all, in Alabama, we have projected that Forrest Fobb James, the new governor of Alabama, just 2% percent of the precincts reporting in thus far, James with the commanding lead, as you can see thus far, and all of our NBC experts say that he will be elected governor of Alabama. Forrest Fobb James describes himself as a born-again Democrat. He left the party at the time of George McGovern, raised a lot of money for Republican candidates in Alabama, then came back into the party to run for the party's nomination for governor this time, surprised a lot of people by winning it, despite the fact that Governor George Wallace had endorsed another uh, Democrat in the primary. Bob James got the nomination, and tonight we're projecting that he is the winner. David likes this little bit of uh, information, so I'll throw it in once again. Bob James made his fortune by inventing the plastic dumbbell. 
and then a lot of other athletic equipment as well. Went on to make a lot of money with that. <laughs> like they say, opportunity is not dead in America. That's right. He's an engineer, and someone came to him and said, my dumbbell scratches up my floor. I want something that won't do it. And he came up with the answer to it. That's is that what it. the advantage is of a plastic dumbbell? That's right. I've that's been waiting for somebody to tell me. That's one of the advantages. And they don't break as easily as well. And that's as much as I know about plastic dumbbells. All right. Thing, before All right. I get myself if you hear any, any more, let us know. We're going down to Mississippi now to the Thad Cochran headquarters. And Andrea Mitchell is standing by. Andrea? David, the retirement of Jim Eastland gives Mississippi voters their first chance to have a wide open Senate race in more than 30 years. Now, Mississippi voters have deserted the Democratic Party for Republican presidential candidates, but in state elections, they vote for Democrats. But the Republicans this year have their first chance since Reconstruction Days to send a Republican to the U.S. Senate. He is Congressman Thad Cochran, a conservative, as is his Democratic opponent, Maurice Danton. Republican chances here are good this year, not because of national Republican issues, but because of the third candidate in the race, independent Charles Evers. Evers, the controversial mayor from Fayette, who is the brother of the slain civil rights leader, has won a lot of support from white audiences, but whether they will vote for him is another issue. He has taken a conservative stand on issues such as welfare, welfare fraud, and busing. In any case, uh, we'll have to see whether or not he'll be able to combine those things, but he will be able to siphon off enough votes to possibly elect a Republican. This is Andrea Mitchell, NBC News, Jackson, Mississippi. Um, Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion, went to Mississippi and made a commercial for uh, Evers, in which he said, Evers is my man, and if you don't vote for him, I'll punch you in the nose. <laughs> we, um, our NBC News AP poll tickers, like Beavers, have been out, and they have now questioned 24,000 voters as they left the polling booths. And they asked them, among much else, asked them whether they thought it would make any difference in their lives who was elected. Well, the result may be surprising is this. 35% said it would not make any difference in their lives who won or lost in today's elections. 51% disagreed and said it would make a difference to them. Not unexpectedly. Not the biggest majority in the world, but a majority. And all of this fits in with the pictures we have been hearing about voter apathy before the elections and indifference following the elections. Jessica? David, we have an outlook on some of the Senate races here. Two of them, as a matter of fact. One of them that we call early in the evening, the Kentucky Senate race. The Kentucky race there, you see 56% of the precincts reporting Democrat Walter Huddleston easily winning over his opponent in Kentucky. And we project by the end of the evening that Walter Huddleston will have 62% of the vote when the evening is over. I talked to Senator Huddleston before he went back to Kentucky to campaign, and he said he really did expect to win. He didn't expect it to be that difficult of a race. He said, my opponent didn't put together an organized campaign. He's poorly organized. He had problems getting the leaders of his party behind him, and I figure that I'll be able to do it in Kentucky, and he certainly did. Another race, the Virginia race. This has been getting a lot of attention nationwide, not because the race is that exciting, but because one of the candidates happens to be the husband of actress Elizabeth Taylor. Not that many precincts reporting, 3% reporting so far. And in that race, you see that Republican John Warner has 48% of the vote, and his opponent Andrew Miller has a <coughs> commanding lead. We'll see what happens in that race, and we'll see just how much of an issue actress Elizabeth Taylor really was in that campaign. John. And we have a projection in the state of North Carolina in the Senate race, NBC, South Carolina, beg your pardon, in the Senate race, NBC News projects Senator Strom Thurmond as re-elected in South Carolina. He's had three terms in the Senate. He's 75 years old, and they, well, according to our projection, he will go back for another six years. Strom Thurmond over Pug Ravenel, uh, who gave him quite a contest this year, but Strom Thurmond came through as he so often does. One of the interesting states this year is Minnesota, where traditionally the Democratic Farmer Labor Party has um, run things in that state, but it isn't quite the same now as it used to be. They lost a primary candidate, Don Fraser, they like very much. And Bob Jamison is at DFL headquarters in Minnesota now to talk to us. Bob? John, what is at stake here tonight is more than the two Senate seats, but the historic liberal progressive domination of the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. There was, as you mentioned, a very divisive primary, and Hubert Humphrey was dead and could not put the coalition back together that he formed so many years ago. With Senator Humphrey at the birth of the Democratic Farmer Labor Coalition was Arthur Naftalin, who is now a professor at the University of Minnesota and a former mayor of Minneapolis. 
What are the chances for survival of that coalition after this election? I think that the uh, Democratic Farm Labor Party uh, remains in uh, essentially stable condition. Uh, it suffered some uh, serious internal stresses and polls. The death of Humphrey, of course, has been a very serious blow. And the contest between Bob Short and Don Fraser was a very serious drain on the internal uh, stability of the party. Is it I also suffering possibly because of a shift a swing to the right, a drift to the right in this state as in so many other states over the issue of taxes. That's, uh, that's not so clear in Minnesota. The uh, basic uh, polling data would suggest that the fundamental strength of the DFL is holding firm. Okay. That would be our best guess. Thank you very much, Mr. Nafflin. Bob Jamison, NBC News, Minneapolis. I think there'll be a lot more news out of Minnesota this evening, and we'll be watching that. We'll have more coverage after this. The Subaru Brat Sweepstakes. Subaru is now giving away four-wheel drive brats and mini brat go-karts. <laughs> you don't even have to make a purchase. Can I have <laughs> Details, yes you can. Uh, details are at participating dealers. <laughs> uh, any licensed driver can win. Licensed driver! Wait, uh, that's for the brats. Uh, kids entered win the gas-powered mini brats. Seventy percent of all cavities happen in back teeth and between teeth, where a toothbrush often misses. New FluoraGuard Dental Rinse can help. Fluoride in a liquid. Say this picket fence is your teeth. Brushing the front is easy, but seventy percent of all cavities happen back here and in between. FluoraGuard floods teeth with fluoride, reaches places brushing might miss. After brushing, rinse with good-tasting FluoraGuard. Puts cavity-fighting fluoride where the danger is. Come on. You can make it out of bag. I was dependent on you. Lamar, talking to trash, won't do it. Get hefty bonded two-ply trash bags. They're double dependable. See, there's a tough outside layer to resist tears up and down. Bonded to a strong inside layer for strength side to side. Hefty bonded two-ply. It's one bag that's double dependable. Yay, team. <laughs> Your hand. We projected a minute ago the re-election of Senator Strom Thurmond, the Republican senator in South Carolina, whose many distinctions include the fact he is the only senator of 75 years who has four children under seven years old. We'll be back after this. Decision 78 continues with the Tri-State Report. Brought to you by Amoco and by Citibank. Now here are Chuck Scarborough and Jack Cafferty. Good evening, welcome back to our Tri-State coverage. We're now within about seven minutes of the polls closing in New Jersey and Connecticut, Chuck. Not much time left, Jack. These are probably the toughest minutes for the candidates themselves. There simply is nothing left to do but wait. And we've been gearing up. We've talked to thousands of tri-state voters throughout the day to try and get a feeling why they voted the way they did, and we'll have a result of our polling throughout the evening tonight, Jack. In New Jersey today, there is a unique U.S. Senate race, one that is getting national attention, being watched by both parties. One candidate's 34 years old, the other one is 35, and neither one of them has ever held any elected public office before. The Democratic candidate, of course, by now you know, is Nick's basketball star, former star Bill Bradley. The Republican is former Reaganade Jeffrey Bell. Jim Ryan and Jim Collis are at those two candidates' headquarters, and first we're going to switch to Jim Ryan at Bradley headquarters. Jim? Jack, as you said, Bill Bradley is well-known in New Jersey and well-known all across the country. Jeff Bell is a symbol of Republican determination to cash in on the tax issue. And that's why a lot of people across the country are watching this race. The irony is that a lot of people in New Jersey couldn't care less. One voter out of every three in the Garden State isn't even registered to vote. So Bill Bradley, who's running far ahead in the polls, is running not so much against Jeff Bell as he is against apathy. Now to Jim Collis at Jeff Bell headquarters. Yes, the polls close here in New Jersey in just a few minutes at 8 o'clock straight up. And uh, Republican candidate Jeff Bell says he'll be watching very closely the returns from the key counties, the populous counties, Essex, Hudson, Union, Bergen. 
Bell told me that if he can come out of Hudson County, a Democratic stronghold, with only 43% of the vote, his chances of winning tonight would be excellent. And now back to Jack in the studio. Well, all right, thank you, Jim. Over in Connecticut, Governor Ella Grasso has been running for re-election from a position of strength. She scored a big victory in September's Democratic primary when she was challenged by her own lieutenant governor. And her opponent tonight, the Republican Congressman Ronald Saracen, isn't nearly as well known as Ms. Grasso, nor does he have the strength of the incumbency behind him. Mary Alice Williams is at Saracen headquarters. Bill Ryan is with Governor Grasso. In a few moments, the polls here in Connecticut will close, and then the machine-counted votes will start pouring in. But in the meantime, we do have one result. From New Haven, absentee ballots show Grasso leading Saracen by a 70% to 30% margin. And, of course, the people at the Democratic Central Committee here in Hartford are hoping that maintains the momentum throughout the state. Now to Mary Alice Williams at Saracen headquarters. GOP leaders say Ronald Saracen and his running mate, State Senator Lou Rome, make up the strongest Republican slate in years. And Saracen has aimed his campaign right at the voters' pocketbooks. He's promised to cut welfare costs and the sales tax, even proposed a constitutional amendment to limit spending, so Connecticut would never need an income tax. Saracen says his opponents a spendthrift. More important, he says Governor Grasso has failed to provide strong leadership. But right now, as the votes are being counted, Saracen is still the underdog. I'm Mary Alice Williams in Hartford. Now back to Jack in New York. Thank you, Mary Alice. The polls in both Connecticut and New Jersey now will close in less than five minutes, so we'll have some returns for you very soon. And by the way, if you haven't voted and the polling place isn't right next door, you're out of luck till next time. Chuck? Indeed. Thank you, Jack. We'll take a look at some of the other statewide races in New York right after this message. You expect more from a leader. You expect innovative ideas from Amoco. We were a leader in developing lead-free gasoline, the first major brand with two grades of lead-free, the first with premium lead-free. Amoco Premium Lead-Free, proven by experience to help stop engine run-on, to burn smoother, and help stop knock. And even improve mileage, because you don't have to change the timing to prevent knock. Amoco Premium Lead-Free. Don't you deserve interest on your checking account? Aren't you fed up with banks using your money and giving you nothing in return? Well, those days are over. Now Citibank can give interest on checking. It's 5% checking. 24-hour banking gets better. So get out. Go to the window and shout, I'm going to Citibank to get what I deserve. Interest on checking. I'm going to Citibank to get what I deserve. Interest on checking. Interest on checking. Interest on checking. checking. I'm going to Citibank to get what I deserve. Interest on checking. For as long as most of us can remember, Louis Lefkowitz has been Attorney General and Arthur Levitt has been State Controller in New York. And now both men are calling it quits. Lefkowitz, a Republican after 22 years, and Levitt, a Democrat after 24 years in office. And one man who's trying to succeed Lefkowitz is Bronx Borough President Robert Abrams, who could become the first Democratic Attorney General in 36 years. Abrams ran against Lefkowitz four years ago. His challenger this year is Republican conservative Mike Roth. He's a lawyer and he's former chairman of the State Liquor Authority. City Controller Harrison Golden is looking to move into the state controller's job in the Democratic and liberal lines. His opponent is Erie County Executive Edward Regan from Buffalo. Regan ran against Arthur Levitt eight years ago and lost by nearly a million votes. Jack? Chuck, Tony Guida now has more for us on the biggest one-day poll in America. The folks were questioned outside 275 polling places here around New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Tony? Jack, one question in our News Center for AP Election Day poll is designed to test the so-called apathy factor. Now, that's a little tricky because the nature of the poll obviously excludes the truly apathetic, the people who didn't bother to go to the polls. We did question more than 30,000 voters nationwide, and we asked all of them, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? No matter who is elected today, this election, like most others, won't make life any better or worse. Nationwide, a little more than a third of the voters, 35%, agreed it will make no difference to them. More than half, 51%, disagreed, no apathy for them. 14% were not sure, either way. In New York, however, we found a very different picture. A plurality of New Yorkers, 46%, agreed that the election will make no difference. 39% disagreed, 15% weren't sure. You could say New Yorkers are more sophisticated. You could say perhaps that they're more blasé. In any case, more of them just couldn't care less. Chuck? Okay, the polls are closed for all practical purposes right now in Connecticut, Jack, so 
It's all over there. We still have an hour in New York, though. We'll be back with some numbers in just a few minutes. Right now, though, back to NBC News and Decision 78. When you fly on business, you pay full fare. And on American Airlines, you get what you pay for. Introducing a special coach section for full fare passengers only, so your seatmate will be a full fare passenger. And when we have empty seats, most of them will be in this section. At last, you'll get the full fare treatment you deserve. On American, you get what you pay for. We're American Airlines, doing what we do best. Doing what we do best. Bobby Rydell with Shalana, tomorrow night at 7.30. From the NBC News Election Center... Uh, tomorrow night at 7.30. From the NBC News Election Center in New York, Decision 78. Reported by John Chancellor, David Brinkley, Tom Brokaw, and Jessica Savage. Here is John Chancellor. The polls have closed, or just about to close now, in about 16 states around the country. So if you're watching during this hour, we ought to get lots of returns and lots of projections. We already have a number of projections for the Senate and the governorships. And let's look at our map first in terms of the U.S. Senate and NBC News' projected winners. We have projected Sam Nunn, the um, Democrat in Georgia, Walter Huddleston in Kentucky, Louisiana was no contest. Strom Thurmond, you see there, in blue in North Carolina, uh, he is our projected winner. And Charles Percy, coming out of a very squeaky contest in the state of Illinois, being returned as our projected winner. Which gives us, in terms of those elected so far tonight, four Democratic senators we tally as having been elected or re-elected, all of them re-elected in that case, and two Republicans. Now let's look at the map and see what it tells us about the vote for governor around the country. And again, you see that bright blue mark in the middle of your screen. That stands for Jim Thompson in Illinois, easily re-elected as governor of Illinois, our projected winner. Also, Alabama and Georgia. Fob James in Alabama and George Busby in Georgia. And this gives us these figures as far as governors are concerned. Two Democrats projected winners, one Republican projected winner. The Strom Thurmond victory was, I suppose, no surprise, although some people thought that Pug Ravenel actually could bring it off down there. Bob Bazell of our staff is with one of Senator Thurmond's senior aides now. Yes, John, I'm here with Mr. Allison Dalton, who is Strom Thurmond's campaign manager. Mr. Dalton, uh, Mr. Thurmond ran a, a pretty hard campaign, even though he's been in the Senate for a long time. Uh, why was that? Well, Senator Thurmond always takes these races seriously. Uh, he's a very serious man, as you know. He's very intense. He's very dedicated. And he approached this race with just that attitude that he was not going to fail to win because of lack of effort. And, and he's insisted that we all keep moving and keep our nose to the grindstone. And that's what we've done, right down to the wire. Well, was there any point in the campaign when you thought you might not win it? Well, no, it really looked good all along, Bob. Uh, the senator started very early, as you may or may not know. We started uh, almost a year ago on the campaign and have, have worked very hard. The senator is on his weekends in South Carolina, has been traveling the state regularly, and then as soon as the Senate adjourned, he was here on a full-time basis. So he's worked very hard. Uh, you had to get a good, good percentage of the black vote to get this uh, election this time because of the large black registration here in South Carolina. Uh, was that difficult for you? Well, I don't think it was. The senator has done so much for the blacks of this state, and they understand that. The senator has been, uh, he's always known for his constituent service, and the blacks are his constituents, so he's done a good job. Thank you very much, Mr. Allison Dalton. Strom Thurmond, the winner here in South Carolina. Thank you. We have two projections. The first in New Jersey, in the election of a senator. An interesting race. Our projected winner is Bill Bradley, the Democrat, the winner in New Jersey for the Senate. Bill Bradley, the Senate, Democrat, New Jersey. We have a projection in Michigan, in the election of a governor. Our projection, our projected winner, is Milliken, the Republican, re-elected governor of Michigan. Uh, what do you think of that, or two experts? Well, that's good news uh, for Republicans and especially for moderate Republicans. Uh, Bill Milliken, who was running for his third term in Michigan, was a big target up there. Ted Kennedy went out and campaigned for the young Democratic challenger, a man by the name of William Fitzgerald, who had a very slick and, we were told, effective media campaign. Apparently, it was not effective enough. At any rate, Milliken has been a moderate Republican in that part of the Midwest, and uh, he is now, we are projecting, the winner. And that's kind of a surprise. He was thought to be in a very tough race. 
Tom, what do you think that might do in terms of the state of Michigan to Senator Griffin and his attempts to getting reelected? I, I know it's pretty early to tell, but it could have some effect. They're very close. Milliken and, uh, and Griffin are from the same town. They're both from Traverse City, Michigan, and they decided to go into public life at about the same time. One of them decided to go to the state house, the other one off to Washington. It could be an indication, but again, we don't know. It is too early, but it is a major victory, not just for Governor Milliken, but for the Republicans in that part of this country, because they thought that they were in for a very tough race up there. And it looked, all the signs were in the closing days of the campaign that Fitzgerald was closing the gap and closing it very effectively. But apparently, he didn't close it enough. Jessica, That's did they, excuse me, David. I just wanted to point out that, that, uh, that uh, election in New Jersey is the first seat to be turned over. The first one held by the Republicans, now That's won right. by the Democrats. That's right. Jessica, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, do you, President Carter was in New Jersey campaigning for Bradley. Did they think when you were talking to them about that, that that helped? Bill Bradley had the edge going into the campaign anyway. Uh, Jeffrey Bell was a relative unknown in the state. I mean, he, he, had, he had been active in state politics. He didn't have that much backing in the Republican organization. Cliff Case, of course, was Mr. Republican, Mr. New Jersey. And when Cliff Case didn't win the primary, Jeff Bell really didn't have all that much of a chance. Bill Bradley, of course, a very popular candidate, well-known basketball player, had a lot of celebrity backing. So it's no surprise, but it is, of course, the first turnover in the Senate tonight. I suppose Bell might have won if he'd been a basketball star. It would depend how well he played, I suppose. <laughs> would you all like another turnover? We have a projection in the state of South Dakota. NBC News projects you, uh, Congressman Larry Pressler as the winner in the Senate uh, contest there against Donald Barnett, or Barnett, sorry. Barnett. And that is the seat that was held by Jim Aberesk, who was a Democrat, so that we are now projecting another turnover in, in, uh, in the Senate. Tom? Not unexpected there, I think. I no. think not. And Presley was expected to win handily going in. Let's take a look at some governor's races around the South at this hour. We're beginning to get some returns from the state of Florida, where we have a couple of new faces in Southern politics running. Just 1% of the precincts reporting thus far. Uh, the returns insignificant at this time and very close. The Democratic nominee there is 42-year-old Robert Graham. He's a young millionaire who shed his pinstripe suits and went out and worked at 100 different jobs around the state of Florida. He called himself a Graham Cracker in an effort to have a kind of populist identification. When he was in the state legislature, he was one of the liberal and progressive state legislators, but as a candidate for governor, he's been considerably more conservative than that. 65-year-old Jack Eckert is the Republican nominee in Florida. He has a little more money than Robert Graham. Mr. Eckert has a personal fortune worth $57.5 million as a result of a string of very successful drugstore chains. If that's a familiar name to you, Eckert, it's because he was the head of the General Services Administration. He was not at all tied to that scandal, but he was hurried, or hurt, worried that it might hurt him in some way in his campaign. In Tennessee, two other young men, in this case, extremely well off. Jake Butcher is the Democratic nominee in Tennessee. We have not even marginal returns in at this time, something just over 500 votes that we've counted thus far. Jake Butcher is a young banker. He's done business in the past with Burt Lance. That's raised some eyebrows and some questions. Nothing has come of that so far. In 1977, Jake Butcher reported an income of two and a half million dollars. His brother is so concerned that if Jake Butcher is elected governor of Tennessee that he won't be able to get along on that state salary of $50,000 that he's offered to give him an allowance of $100,000 annually. The Republican nominee in Tennessee is Lamar Alexander, another young, wealthy lawyer. He walked the entire state of Tennessee this time in an effort to draw some attention to himself. And he became the subject of some controversy in the Tennessee governor's race because he was the part owner of a club in Gatlinburg with a rather catchy name of Ruby Tuesdays. In Georgia, we have already projected a winner in Georgia tonight. The incumbent Democratic governor in Georgia is George Busby. 1% of the precincts reporting thus far, we are projecting that he will be re-elected to a four-year term. He campaigned not as a workhorse, as he put it, rather not as a show horse, but as a workhorse. And by the way, Jake Butcher, that uh, young Texas, uh, Tennessee millionaire that we were talking about just a few moments ago, he lives now in a private home that we're told has 13 bathrooms. And through extensive checking, we were able to determine that the Tennessee governor's mansion has six bathrooms. So if he is elected tonight, he will be running a seven-bathroom deficit. David? A net loss of seven a bathrooms? A net loss of seven <laughs> bathrooms in Tennessee. Well, he obviously is determined to sacrifice himself on the altar of public service. Absolutely. We'll be back after this. <laughs>
Introducing a new American road car. The all-new Ford LTD for 79. With more front seat room, more rear seat room, more window area, and more handling ease than last year's LTD. Plus the power of a V8 engine standard. A road car to take you across town or across the country. This land is your land. This land is my land. To test drive the all-new LTD on your own roads, see your Ford dealer today. 70% of all cavities happen in back teeth and between teeth, where a toothbrush often misses. New FluoraGuard Dental Rinse can help. Fluoride in a liquid. Say this picket fence is your teeth. Brushing the front is easy, but 70% of all cavities happen back here and in between. FluoraGuard floods teeth with fluoride, reaches places brushing might miss. After brushing, rinse with good-tasting FluoraGuard. Puts cavity-fighting fluoride where the danger is. America's most efficient energy system, gas. Some people think we'll be out of it when the 21st century arrives. They're wrong. We can deliver more gas. We'll still be getting large amounts of gas from underground. We plan to increase these supplies with new gas from new sources, like gas made from coal. The future looks bright for new long-term technologies, too, but it still makes sense to use gas wisely. These results are being watched with the most intense interest, needless to say, at the two parties' headquarters in Washington, the Republicans and the Democrats, and so we're going to switch there and see what's happening, what the mood is. First to the Republican National Committee and Chris Wallace. Chris? David, the Republicans spent more than $12 million on this election, and the question tonight is, will they get their money's worth? As the evening begins, Republican leaders are predicting only modest gains, a pickup of 15 to 20 seats in the House, four to six governors, no gains in the Senate, and about 200 more seats in state legislative races. By historical standards, not much of an election. The Republicans feel they have been successful in drawing attention to economic issues. GOP ratings on controlling inflation and spending are up from recent years. But they acknowledge that the Democrats have also jumped on inflation, blunting the GOP attack. The Republicans' big hope tonight is the high number of close races across the country. Two years ago, the Democrats took the vast majority of these races. Tonight, the Republicans hope that it's their turn. Chris Wallace at Republican National Headquarters. The Democratic National Committee spent about $300,000 helping Democratic candidates in this election, about half what the Republicans spent. But here tonight, the mood is one of quiet optimism. Their spirits were buoyed by recent polls which show that many Democratic candidates have come ahead making late gains in this campaign, that many Democratic candidates preempted issues that the Republicans had hoped to win on, taxes and inflation. The Democrats are realistic to know that they're going to lose some state houses, or think they probably will lose some state houses in this campaign. They think they'll hold their own in the Senate, where they currently hold 62 seats. But most of the officials here at this Democratic headquarters believe that the real battlefield in this 1978 election is going to be the House of Representatives. Chairman John White was here earlier. He said that he was gratified by the large turnout that's being uh, forecast in many of the states. So the Democrats are waiting, quietly optimistic. Douglas Kiker, NBC News, the Democratic National Committee. The thing to remember is that the average loss in one of these non-presidential years to the party in the White House has been, uh, in this century, about 34, 35 seats. So if you keep 34 or 35 in mind, then you can gauge for yourselves how well or how poorly the Democrats will do in the House today or tonight. And nobody expects them really to, to lose 35, but traditionally the average loss for the party in the White House in a non-presidential year is about 33 to 35 seats in the House. Jessica? A couple of races we'd like to look at in the Senate, John. In Alabama, there are, of course, two Senate races. One was decided before the uh, evening even began because uh, no one wanted to run against one of the candidates was so strong there, Howell Heflin. But the other race, the race for the late Senator James Allen's seat, 2% of the precincts reporting in so far. And you see there that Donald Stewart, well ahead of his opponent, Republican James Jim Martin. In Georgia, we've already projected a winner there in Georgia. We project that Senator Sam Nunn will retain his Senate seat. 1% of the precincts reported, but we're already able to make that uh, projection. 87% of the vote to none. 
In Kentucky, another projection we were already able to make, 57% of the precincts reporting there. Democrat Walter H D. Huddleston, 62% of the vote so far. In South Carolina, another projection that we made. Strom Thurmond, Republican, will be able to hang on to his Senate seat that he was fighting to hold on to from Pug Ravenel. There was a young man who came home to the state. He was a uh, stockbroker, wealthy man, came home and ran for governor and was declared ineligible because he was too young, but he got name identification, ran against Strom Thurmond, and the issue in that campaign was whether Strom Thurmond, at 75 years old, was still able to handle the job. And so Strom Thurmond, to neutralize that issue, sent his 31-year-old wife and their four children, all under eight years old, around the state in a van called the Strom Trek. Mm. And all of them wore t-shirts that said, vote for my daddy. And Strom finally wound it up by going to a birthday party for his son that was held at a firehouse. And he kept sliding down the fire pole to show how well he could do. Strom Thurmond there, we project, will be the winner in his state. Gentlemen. Jessica, our NBC News AP poll takers, have been, are all, they're all over the place. They're stopping people everywhere as they leave the polls. So far, they have stopped and asked questions of 25,000 people. And on one critical question, what they think the economy is likely to do in the next year, a measurement of their optimism. The mood of the country is pessimistic. Only 14% thought things would get better. 43% thought things, economically speaking, would get worse. 33% thought they would remain about the same. Of the small percentage of those who are optimistic, and there really aren't many, twice as many of those were Democrats as Republicans, because they tell us that Democrats historically take a rosier view of the future than Republicans do. I would not have any idea why. We'll be back in a moment. in Fairmont. I like them both. Thousands of people compare Plymouth Valari and Ford Fairmont, and they're comparable. The same EPA size class, about the same mileage with comparable equipment. But they're different, too. From seating for six to wheelbase and track, we think Valari four doors more car. Equipped with six-cylinder engine and automatic transmission, sticker price is about the same. A solid, substantial car. That's Valari. That's imagination. That's Just gotta have a treat, oh, but you shouldn't eat. Wow, I could have had a V8. Snacking the whole night through, oh, what that does to you. Wow, I could have had a V8. V8 cocktail vegetable juice tastes great and is naturally low in calories. Just 35 calories a six ounce serving. But remember, the time to think of having a V8 is before you've had something else. Wow, I could have had a V8. Pretty confusing, but there's one that simply tells it like it is. Coronet, always a good buy. Now it's dramatically improved. It's softer and more absorbent than ever. Strong, too. Yet Coronet still costs less than most other national brands and gives you 125 towels to a roll. That's enough to put Coronet out front. We now have a different kind of report this evening from Kenley Jones, who's at Magnolia Towers in Orlando, Florida, with somebody who's been voting for really quite a long time. Kenley? John, I'm talking to Elmer Klebert, who's 83 years old. His wife, Gladys, is here sitting beside him. Mr. Klebert came to Florida from Chicago, and uh, he's lived here now in Florida for quite some time. You told me earlier today that you were going to vote for new politicians and not the old ones, and I want you to tell me why. Well, I believe that we should have all new people down in Washington. All the old ones haven't done anything for us, so let's put all the new ones in. That's my idea. You think the new ones might do better than the old ones? Well, if they don't, we can put them out again in two years or so, but at least uh, we've got a chance. All that age and experience doesn't mean anything? Not to me, I don't know. Have politicians changed much during the time that you've been voting? Well, I should say so. I would say they have changed an awful lot. All they do is just raise and tell you all the good things they're going to do for you. Raise your wages and cut taxes and so forth and so on. And then when they get down there, 
They don't do it. So what? So they've changed for the worse. They have changed for the worse. Okay, thank you very much. This is Ken Lee Jones at Magnolia Towers in Orlando. And NBC News now projects in the state of Tennessee, Howard Baker to be the winner of that state senatorial contest this year. Howard Baker, who won handily the last time, got in a little trouble because of the Panama Canal. Jane Eskind, who was his opponent. Now, you'll see on there that we have very few votes, but we have analytical tools at our disposal that will enable us to make a projection. Uh, Baker, we felt all along, might be the winner, and these early returns that we have here tonight bear that out. In any case, Howard Baker is our projected winner to be reelected from the Senate in the state of Tennessee. And among the senators tonight that we have projected, as you can you saw on our map, the one that was, I think, the most interesting story so far was Charles Percy in Illinois, who had a, ran a, uh, had a very difficult time and was very far behind in the polls at one time. And he has come back. And, uh, uh, and I don't, have you seen any figures on him, Jessica? No, uh, we've, we've not seen a breakdown on, we on how, how that. well that he is, he's doing yeah. right now. But uh, he was projected a winner early enough in the evening with a somewhat sizable percentage of the vote. See if we can get a breakdown on it. The, the one thing that I did notice about Chuck Percy was that I've been watching politics for a long time, and I don't think I ever saw a commercial on television from a politician that had such desperation in it as Chuck Percy's final television commercials in which he said, I know you've sent me a message. I've got the message. If you don't vote for me, I'm not going to be there to receive it. I thought that was an extraordinary moment, a kind of a poignant moment of great desperation of a politician trying to hold on to his job. Well, the campaign had devalued to such a point with those charges back and forth, one calling the other saying they had mob connections, saying, and, the, and then his opponent saying that he had racial, there's some racial overtones, and it really got desperate down to the wire. Well, I, I don't think, I think accurately, we ought to characterize what happened in Illinois as Mr. Seath's commercials really were regarded by people out there in both parties and in all the newspapers of really being pretty bad and yes it did get mixed up toward the end but it was a tough uh, contest I thought a very rough one Charles Percy even had uh, Muhammad Ali in his corner Muhammad Ali has been very active in this uh, campaign he Jesse campaigned Jackson in as well. Mississippi but uh, Muhammad Ali and Jesse Jackson both came out on behalf of Charles Percy at the end there was some suggestion that uh, he may be against blacks Percy may be against blacks and one of the seat ads and the other thing about the Percy race which is so interesting is that Percy Seath race is that Alex Seath the Democrat really adopted all the Republican con conservative positions uh, as opposed to so many Democrats this year who are adopting the the conservative positions of the Republican Party it's getting very difficult to tell the Republicans and the Democrats apart especially on the issues. Um, that brings us up to this point. We'll have more election coverage after this. One of the political phenomena that have had a lot of Decision 78 continues with a tri-state report brought to you by American Airlines. Now here are Chuck Scarborough and Jack Cafferty. And good evening to you once again. Welcome to New Center Force coverage of election results in the tri-state area. Senate candidate Jeff Bell's campaign slogan was California has Proposition 13, New Jersey has Jeffrey Bell. And our computers have shown him to be 50% correct. Jack? That's right. California still has Proposition 13, but as you heard on the network portion of our broadcast this evening, NBC News is now projecting that Bill Bradley, the former New York Knicks star, will win the Senate race in New Jersey. He will take over the seat vacated by Clifford Case, Jeffrey Bell beating Case in the primary. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite a story for Mr. Bradley. He's 35 years old. He's never run for office in his life. He was, besides playing with the Knicks, he was with went to Princeton University, he was a Rhodes Scholar, he went to Oxford, he even took a run at this business. He was a CBS radio correspondent for a time, and his first rattle out of the box, he is going to Washington, and he is going to the United States Senate. We'll take a look at the board now, and we'll be able to give you an idea, although we have precious few votes counted from over there, we are projecting that Bill Bradley will win 
with, uh, uh, or he's getting rather, 51% of the votes that have been counted thus far uh, to Jeffrey Bell's 49%. However, I believe the projection is that Mr. Bradley is going to win quite handily in New Jersey. And we now have Jim Ryan standing by at Bradley headquarters over at the Meadowlands Hilton in Secaucus, and we're going to switch to him for this live report. Jim? Uh, Jack, when the, announce when the announcement came here of the NBC projection of Bradley's victory, well, it was met with kind of a mild applause, as if everybody kind of expected that to happen. Later on, the band started playing, and things got a lot more raucous. They might just start any second now, so be prepared for a blast if they do. At any rate, I talked with Bradley earlier this evening and tried to get some idea of what his priorities would be if we went to Washington. Campaign, I said I wanted to... Uh get to the United States Senate to uh, focus national attention on New Jersey and be an advocate for our interests. And my hopes for committee assignments would be based upon those criteria. Uh, but that's, uh, at this time, uh, a little far in the future. And we want to get through the next couple of hours before we uh, make any statements about uh, committees. Yeah, it's interesting to, uh, to note two, uh, two things that you might expect uh, that were uh, consequent to, to Bradley's victory, and that were that an overwhelming number of Democratic voters voted for Bradley, you'd expect that, and an overwhelming number of liberal voters just voted for Bradley, you'd expect that also. What you wouldn't expect is that almost half of the voters who said they were in favor of the tax cut issue voted for Bradley, a surprise. Back to the studio. As you can imagine, there's not much to cheer about here at Jeff Bell's headquarters in Trenton. The candidate is upstairs on the sixth floor watching the returns and the projections. The supporters, what few are here, are watching on the monitors. And no cheers, not even mild applause. No official statement, no concession here for at least, at least an hour. Now back to Jack in the studio. All right, thank you very much. That, of course, was Jim Collis at uh, Jeff Bell's headquarters. The Republicans had been looking at Jeff Bell's campaign nationally very carefully. They were looking to see if his tax-cutting dialogue was going to have some impact. Apparently, it does not. In Connecticut, Governor Allegrasso is trying to win re-election to another term of office. We have a few scattered returns beginning to come in from Connecticut now. We'll go to the board and take a look. Again, it is too early to call. Only 1% of the precincts reporting at this point, and she has a 20 percentage points lead over her opponent up there, Michael Saracen. And, um, so we will switch now to um, the uh, Grasso uh, headquarters in Windsor Locks, where Bill Ryan is standing by at Governor Grasso's home. Bill